Our first guest of this year's DealBook Conference on our 20-year anniversary is Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, the second largest company in the world. As we all try to make sense of this moment, and boy, is it a moment, the heightened scrutiny of Silicon Valley, we're trying to deal with supply chains, privacy, security, mental health issues, fair competition, the shifting role of CEOs amid employee activism, climate change, globalism, and of course, innovation. There is no one I would want to talk to more than Tim Cook. He took over from Steve Jobs, of course, just a decade ago, and under his leadership, Apple now has more than a billion active iPhone users across the globe. The company's value has increased from $348 billion to about $2.5 trillion. He is, dare I say, one of the most consequential business leaders on the planet and of our time. And Tim, I want to thank you for being here to help us kick things off. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for inviting me. I, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, Tim, you know, you are marking your own anniversary in this job, 10 years since the passing of Steve Jobs. And I thought we could actually start there because in many ways you could help set the table for the day uh, because it feels like we're at this sort of unique inflection point, especially when it comes to technology, which has done so many remarkable things for the planet. But we're also now having to grapple with the impact of that technology on the way we live our lives, uh, in ways that perhaps were unforeseen before. And it feels to me like it would be very, fa it, would, it would be fascinating to me to try to understand how you see this moment and really actually how your job has changed over the last decade. You know, I'm still very optimistic, Andrew. And I, I look at technology and I think about all of the things that we can do, both are doing and can do in the future if technology is used to serve humanity and not the other way around. And so, you know, whether it's 10 years or, or longer, uh, I always think about the user and uh, are, are we doing the right things as a company to help improve their lives and empower them to do things they haven't done before. Uh, with my 10 year anniversary, I'm also thinking about 10 years without Steve. And so it's a uh, bit of a sad time, too, for, for me th thinking about that. Uh, you know, from my point of view, he was the inventor, the entrepreneur of the decade, uh, or of the century, rather. And, uh, and there's just nobody quite like him, and I, I miss him every day. You know, he used to talk about Apple being at the, the intersection of technology and humanity. And boy, are we at that moment now in terms of some of these larger questions that have been raised around privacy and mental health and so many other things. What do you think he would think of this? I think he would be happy to see what Apple is doing uh, and Apple's role in uh, helping people and helping improve their lives and, and still caring deeply about the products that we put out and how they're used and so forth. I think in terms of the broader uh, issues, I think he knew some of them were coming. I mean, he, he talked about privacy uh, over a decade ago and uh, really geared the company decades ago to, to, to fight for people's privacy. But, you know, he, he said something very simple. He said that people should know what they're signing up for, that you should ask them repeatedly for their permission uh, in plain language. And you, you look back and it's so simple but yet it's been so profound uh, that that hasn't uh, been the case many times. And uh, so I, I think he had the vision to know that a lot of these issues were coming. You've made a number of, of big moves and changes, in fact, in terms of the operating system around the iPhone in the past year, around privacy, specifically to give users the access and optionality to effectively say, no, I don't want to be tracked. Uh, we're starting to learn the impact of that, uh, not just on users themselves, but on some of the companies and developers on your platform. Collectively, it appears that there have been estimates that, that companies like Facebook and Google and others uh, have lost about $10 billion in revenue as a function of not being able to track users. Do you think that's a good thing? I think the, I don't know about the estimates, Andrew, I, so I can't, I can't um, testify to those kind of numbers, but I think that uh, from our point of view, privacy is a basic human right. And that the people that ought to be deciding whether the data shared is the person themselves. 
And so what, what we've been all about is putting the power with the user. We're not making the decision. We're just simply prompting them to be asked if they want to be tracked across apps or not. And of course, many of them are deciding no and never wanted to be. It's just that they didn't have a choice before. And, and so I feel really good and I'm getting great feedback from users about having the choice. Okay, so what do you do personally? And I will tell you, I, I oscillate. There's sometimes where I'll say you can track me while the app is open. Sometimes I say you can track me all the time. Very rare, actually, that I say you can track me all the time. And a lot of the times I say don't track me at all. I do a combination of those two. And, and to, to me, it depends on the trust of the developer. You know, do- So that's do, a great question though, but how do you know? Uh, I'm not sure you really know uh, definitively, but you have a feel. And uh, I think the companies that are uh, more trusted are likely getting very different results than those that are not trusted. That's fascinating to, in, terms of, in terms of that trust. Um, obviously one of the, the companies that's come under a lot of fire for trust is Facebook. When you think about what we've seen over the last uh, several months in terms of uh, news that's come out around mental health and uh, the way teenagers use phones, but maybe more in particular use apps. I'm curious what your reaction has been to all of that. I, I think mental health is one of the most important topics of the time. And I, I think it's been taboo for, for so long. It hasn't been out uh, where people felt free to talk about it. And, and I think it deserves uh, great uh, research and, and study and that all of us should care about making products that help people's mental health, not, not plays against that. So you've worked on adding screen time and, and all sorts of other features, but then there are apps on the platform that now are raising questions like Instagram, like Facebook. We've heard you know, Mark Benioff say that Facebook is the equivalent of a tobacco company. Does it make you rethink what apps are allowed on the platform? It makes me rethink about the tools that we're providing and to make sure that we're providing great tools for people. Ultimately, I think it's the person's choice. But uh, I know that when we implemented screen time, I found that I was doing things I didn't know I was doing. And, and so I think having sort of a, uh, a truth point where, where you can't deny that you're spending uh, you know, X hours a week on, on things that you might not want to spend X hours a week on or getting hundreds of notifications in a day. Uh, these kind of things, it's, it's powerful what the data will do to your behavior. And I know that I've changed my behavior based on, on screen time. I, I think social media apps represent in terms of time spent, something like 40 or 50% of the amount of time on the service. And, whether you think that's healthy? I think it depends on the person, Andrew. I think it depends on what you're doing. I think if you're scrolling mindlessly or letting yourself be uh, spun up on negativity, I think this is bad. I think it's bad for your mental health. I think it's bad for the people around you. Uh, and, and so, but I think the person that ultimately has to decide that is, the, is that person. And what we have to do is provide the information for them to be able to do that. One of the big debates over this past year has been about the App Store itself and the role and power that the App Store has. Obviously, there's an ongoing um, lawsuit related to Epic, but there's larger questions about platforms and the power and influence of those platforms. And I'm curious how you think about that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to mention you, you know, just recently, Mark Zuckerberg, who was talking about uh, his new um, metaverse, said that this period has been humbling. And he said, living under their rules, I think he was referring to Apple, has profoundly changed my view on the tech industry. I think for, for the App Store, Andrew, we, we invented the App Store to give people the ability to uh, customize their phones more and to give developers the opportunity of a lifetime to bring their products to market. And, and if you look at it, uh, when we started in, in 2007, we didn't have an app store because we couldn't figure out how to achieve the security and the privacy that our customers would want from that. The following year, we opened the app store 
and we did so with a human review and rules. And if you now look at it, what the, that has done is we've gone from 500 apps to over 2 million. And so there's been an explosion of innovation in the, in the area that have been great for consumers, and it's been an incredible business opportunity for developers as well. And so sort of everyone has won from, from this. And the, but the only way it works is if you can have trust and confidence in that, uh, in that commerce solution. As you know, the internet has become uh, a dark place in too many spots. And you don't trust that uh, you don't trust enough to put in your credit card data. You don't trust enough that things do what they report to do. And so, having a place where that trust is built in has been really key for us, and uh, and and key for developers and key for users. And so, th that's what the App Store is all about. I, we've got a couple of questions uh, from from readers uh, ahead yep. of uh, this conversation. And one of them actually relates to this issue of giving users um, the optionality on the issue of privacy and how you think about that relative to the optionality of what might be described as side loading or the app store. They, 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 effectively, the question is, in one case, you're, you're effectively providing access to make your own choice, and in the other, you aren't. And why that is. Well, I think people have that choice today, Andrew, because if you want to sideload, you can buy an Android phone. Right. You know, so that, that choice exists when you go into the carrier shop. If that's important to you, then you should buy an Android phone. From, from our point of view, it would be like um, if I were an automobile manufacturer of telling, telling me not to put uh, airbags and seatbelts on a car. You just, you would never think about doing this in, in today's time. It's just too risky to, to do that. And, and so for, it wouldn't be an iPhone if it didn't maximize security and privacy. What do you think about the issue of fees? Because of course that's, that's central to the debate around uh, the power, if you will, of having a, a store like this. Uh, obviously Epic has, has sued over it. People like Barry Diller have called it criminal to charge 30%. I've made the argument, by the way, if you, if you went from 30% to 20%, invariably people would say it's still not low enough, it needs to get to 10%, and if you got to 10%, they'd say it needs to go to five. But is there, a, is there a moment at which you say to yourself, your success is so great that the responsibility changes in some way? Well, if you, if you look at it, Andrew, 85% or so of the apps on the store, the, the commission is zero because there's not, a, there's not digital commerce happening in the app. And so the vast majority are zero. And then if you look at the, the others of the vast majority of the developers, like 98, 99% pay 15%, uh, because we announced the small developer program back at the beginning of the year, or back last year, and it was effective at the beginning of the year, and that lowered commissions from 30 to 15. Uh, we've also, over the years, changed things like subscriptions in the second year and beyond to 15%. And so commissions have only fallen. They only go down. And the, the, the way that I look at it is the, the most important thing for us is to maintain the security and privacy of the iPhone. That's the most important thing. Everything else can evolve. You know, we had um, the developers wanted to have more price points that they could sell the apps for. And so we're allowing more price points. And so you'll see, uh, you've seen many changes in the past and you'll see more changes in the future. Uh, but the most important thing, sort of our, our North Star, if you will, is about security and privacy. While we're on the issue of payment, I have to ask because we got a slew of questions about it. What's your thought on cryptocurrency right now and potentially either accepting it through Apple Pay or otherwise? Um, it's something that we're looking at. It's not something we have uh, immediate plans to do. Uh, it, for, I would sort of characterize it as there are things that I wouldn't do, like um, uh, our, our cash balance. I wouldn't go invest that in crypto uh, not because I wouldn't invest my own money in crypto, but because I don't think people buy an Apple stock 
to get exposure to crypto. And so if they want to do that, they can, they can uh, uh, you know, invest directly in crypto or through other means. Uh, and so I wouldn't do that. And I'm, I'm not planning to, in the immediate future, to take crypto for our products as a, as a mean of tender. Uh, but there are other things that we're definitely looking at. Like what? Uh, like I wouldn't want to have anything to announce today. <laughs> Well, let me ask you a different question, because you, you just said that you might not do it personally. Do, do you own crypto and any Bitcoin or Ethereum? Would you play around with this? I, I do. Yeah, I think it's reasonable to own it as a, as a part of a diversified portfolio. And I'm not giving anybody uh, investment advice, by the way. <laughs> when, when did you get interested in it? Uh, I've been interested in it for a while. And uh, I've, you know, been researching it and, and, and so forth. And so uh, I think it's interesting. A lot of people, I don't know if you've talked about this publicly before, are, are people going to say that you're a Bitcoin bull? <laughs> I don't know what they're going to say. I wouldn't, I don't want to put any uh, labels on me. It's just that uh, it's something that uh, from a personal point of view, I'm, I'm interested in. Um, well, while we're on the topic, what, what about NFTs? That feels like the next level of this. Uh, I think it's also interesting. Uh, I, th I think it will take a while to, uh, to play out in a way that is for the mainstream uh, person. Uh, but I, I think it's interesting. A, a lot of people talk about NFTs in the context of VR and AR. We just heard from Facebook and Microsoft getting into the, the metaverse. What did, you, what did you think of those announcements and, and how does Apple think about it? Well, I wouldn't want to talk about those announcements, but in terms of the, uh, we've always said that AR is a core technology and it's a technology I get super excited about. And uh, I think it's profound. And I think it's profound in terms of the things that you can do with it and the enhancement to people's lives and the improvement in people's lives. And, but humanity has to be at the center of it. It's like any other technology. Uh, it has to be about humanity and, and helping humanity. And, and so you can bet that the way that we look at it is like that. Uh, but it's, it's an area of great opportunity, I believe. But do you think that there will be a day where we'll all wear, you know, VR goggles and, and live in a digital universe? Uh, all is a big uh, word. <laughs> it's a very big word. And uh, I think there has to be advancements in technology that are beyond what is possible today. Uh, but I get back to AR today is alive and well. You know, we have the largest AR platform on, on iPhone. And you can do things today that uh, a few years ago you couldn't imagine doing. Like uh, if you're shopping for furniture, you can look at the new sofa in your room. Uh, if you're designing a home or designing a home for someone else, uh, it's a great use of, of AR. And uh, so there, there are things that are possible today and I think that that, that just get, becomes more and more exciting as, as time goes on. I know you, you hate to an, as, answer questions about cars, but I am so <laughs> curious um, about your cars uh, or about the expectation of cars. Is there anything you can tell us? No. No, you know, we, we try not to talk about the future too much because we've got so much going on in the current day that we try to be secretive about the future. And so I don't, I don't have anything to share today. It wouldn't be us if we didn't keep something up our sleeves. Okay, let me try out this then. Um, I think it was about a couple of years ago now, as you know, Elon Musk, because he's been public about it, said that he tried to get a meeting with you to sell Tesla to you, in fact, because uh, the company was actually struggling. Now, of course, the company has a trillion dollar market value. You apparently didn't take the meeting. In retrospect, do you wish you did? You know, I've never uh, spoken to Elon. Uh, and, uh, and there are lots of companies out there that, that we could have bought at different times, probably. And I, but I feel really good about where we are today. And, did you uh, know he was trying to get to you? I, I don't remember it being like that, but 
I, but I, but he said that he did, and so I, I assume that that's correct. Um, let me ask you about your role as a CEO, because um, you've been very outspoken on, on a lot of issues, uh, immigration, voting rights, the abortion laws, and in Texas, LGBT issues. And I think a lot of leaders and the public are, are trying to understand the role that corporations should play today when corporations feel that they can speak out and take, take, take a side, if you will, and mm -hmm. when they can't, and how you think about that. I think about uh, not wading into politics, but sort of st sticking to a lane on policy. And, you know, Apple is probably one of the very few uh, medium or large companies that doesn't even have a PAC. And so we, we try to steer clear of the politics on something and, and focus on policy. And if, if it's a policy that uh, intersects with our values or intersects with our company in some way, the likelihood that we're going to speak up is, is great. Uh, if it doesn't intersect, if it's something that we would just be another voice out there and, and not have a, a unique perspective to bring, uh, then we don't say anything. Uh, to take immigration as an example. We have 450 dreamers in Apple. And so we're, we are very focused on uh, getting them a pathway to citizenship. And, uh, and so we're going to speak up on that and speak up for them. Uh, and there, there are other things like that, but, but we're sticking to the policy elements of that, not the politics of it. But, but what happens when, of course, the policy intersects with the poli intersects with the, the politics of it all, right? Well, I think sometimes that you can't prevent that in today's environment, but at, at least our hearts and minds are around the policy. When something is important to you, you have a responsibility to, to say something. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask you, because invariably you have been criticized for not speaking out on human rights issues for example, in China and other, com and other countries as well. Uh, this is something I think a lot of companies that, that have been doing business in China struggle with. A number of companies, as you know, have abandoned China. How do you think about that? I think that we have a responsibility as a business to do business in, in as many places as we can. Uh, because I think business is this huge catalyst. I, I, I believe in what Tom Watson said, is world peace through world trade. I, I, I have always believed that. And so I think we should be about uh, not, you know, not pulling up the drawbridge, but we should be about building the bridges. And uh, so, so I think that's key for business. And in, in terms of what we speak up on, we speak up on some privately, we speak up on some publicly, we do it in different ways. Uh, and you have to get your head around when you're operating outside the U.S. in any country in the world that there are different laws, and and so that that's that's part of the both the complexity and part of the beauty of the world is every everybody has their their own laws and customs. Are there red lines for you? And, and the reason I ask is I absolutely agree that getting a seat at the table matters, and it's very hard to have a seat at the table if you're out there. Scream, screaming from the sidelines at the same time, but trying to figure out the right balance, especially if you don't feel like your voice is being heard inside the room. Well, I think being on the sideline is never a great place. Uh, I, I, at least for a business, I don't think it is. Because uh, as you say, just becoming one of the people yelling in, into the air doesn't do anything. And I feel that way about our country as well. You know, we, we interface with every administration, with both political parties. Uh, we have always done that. And we will always do that because we, we think uh, engagement is the right approach, regardless. And I feel that way internationally as well, is that engagement is the, is the right approach. One of the things that's happening literally as we speak is COP26. And there are a number of companies that have uh, made some pledges around trying to, uh, to get to, to carbon zero or carbon neutral or even, even go negative, if you will. Uh, you've been very outspoken and really ahead on so many of these uh, pledges and, frankly, commitments early on. And I'm curious 
when, when you design a new product today, and I, I know it has to be carbon neutral, but how, how, much of there, how much of there is a trade-off to doing it that way? You know, we don't, we don't view it as a trade-off because it's so ingrained in the way we think of things. Like the, the new iPad and iPad mini have 100% recycled aluminum. Uh, in there as the enclosure. Um, the antenna of the new iPhone 13 is made from upcycled plastic bottles. Uh, it's, it's just the way that our process now works. It's so deeply embedded in the company, it's not a bolt-on. And so we, we don't have um, you know, engineering and then another group on the side that worries about environmental engineering worries about the environmental impact of the products. And it, it's, it's not uh, a burden that we feel to do that. It's not a trade-off we feel to do that. It's just, it's how we approach it at this point. I've, as you know, always bought, I'm, I'm one of the people who always buys the next phone and the next phone that every time there's an upgrade cycle. But one of the conversations in COP26 is this idea of these you know, regular upgrade cycles and, and maybe the idea that we should be holding on to these devices for much longer. What do you think of that? Well, what we do, we know that people are like you, that we have some people like you that buy, want to buy on every, every cycle, which, and we love that. Uh, what we want to, you to do is to turn in or to trade in uh, your existing product, we'll refurbish it and send it out and sell it to somebody else you'll get a nice subsidy for your new iPhone and somebody else will pick up your iPhone and so it lives on. And then at the end of life of the phone, which happens years, years from now, uh, we've, got, we've developed robots that actually disassemble the iPhone into the, into the parts so that we can recycle the parts. And uh, take, um, Take the watch that we just announced, the Series 7 watch. 99% of the rare earth materials are recycled. 99%. And, and so th this, these things are great. And so we're really working on a closed loop system. Last question, Tim. So you know I'm a morning show person, but I think you're a Ted Lasso person. So favorite line? Uh, what would I say? I, he, he said, Coach Lasso said something like, um, there's two buttons I never want to push, panic and snooze. And I, I love that. I love that. He has so many uh, great, great lines, and it has resonated with so many people around the world and, and sort of come out at exactly the right time with, during the pandemic and uh, has been a moment of positivity that all of us want and all of us need, frankly. Tim Cook, uh, hopefully uh, nobody's panicked or snoozed during this conversation. <laughs> I'm grateful for it. Thank you for helping us kick things off today. Thank you. Great seeing you, Andrew. Great seeing you. Thanks.